Good morning, and thank you for joining us as we talk about the COVID-19 pandemic here in Erie County. We have 10 new cases of COVID-19 to report in Erie County as of 3 p.m. yesterday, which brings us to a total of 408 cumulative positive cases in Erie County. There are also two additional deaths being reported. As of 3 p.m. yesterday, we had 243 recovered cases, 157 active cases, and eight deaths. We do not have any more information on these cases or the additional deaths. Of the cumulative cases in Erie County, 54% are female and 46% are male. And here is the breakdown of the total cases by age. 3% are zero to four, 1% are five years to nine years. 5% are ages um, 10 to 18. 13% are ages 19 to 24. 44% are ages 25 to 49. 22% 50 to 64 years. And 11% of the cases are the, in those individuals who are 65 years or older. Please note that the percentage values have been rounded so it may not total exactly 100%. Regarding race and ethnicity of our total cases, 51% are white residents, 34% are African American or black residents, 6% are Asian residents, and 2% are multiracial residents, with 2% being other and 5% being unknown. Regarding the Hispanic origin, um, 81% um, are not Hispanic and 7% are unknown. Um, I'm gonna have to check on that number. It seems a little bit um, complicated on my page here. So we'll get that number up on our website. Now we understand that a few businesses have decided to open in the yellow phase. And we understand that the decision of these business owners was a difficult one. But please understand the risks to your business and how that could affect both your licensure and your um, insurance. And the county does not endorse any business going against the state's order in the yellow phase. I would like to advise you to talk to your legal counsel before you decide to open so that you truly understand the risks you may be taking. Thank you to all of our businesses and our residents who continue to work so diligently to follow the guidelines for safe operations of our businesses that are open here in Erie County. I ask all of you, whether you're going to a business, going to work, or whether you're out enjoying our beautiful community in these summer days, please continue to keep that six foot physical distance from those who do not reside with you in your home. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Sanitize your surfaces regularly particularly those surfaces that are often touched. Wear a mask. This is so important and the evidence continues to grow that wearing a mask anytime that you're outside of your home is one of the best things you can do. It protects you and it protects others. So my mask again is for all of you. Your mask is for me, but there's even some evidence that's growing that my mask may help me and your mask may help you. Today, I have with me, and I'm grateful to have the Director of Public, um, of the Erie County Department of Public Health, Melissa Lyon, and I also have Charlotte Berenger, who is our Director of Community Health Services at the Erie County Department of Health. They're gonna share updates from the Health Department, and we'll start with Director Lyon. Melissa? You're on, Melissa. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Great. So today I would really like to focus on what I believe to be data discrepancy that has the community very concerned. There seems to be distrust and misunderstanding of how public health data collection occurs and is reported. So I'm going to go over what we typically do and then compare it to what's happening in a pandemic. So typical population health data is collected over time and it's entered into a database designed to collect the specific data. So 
So for example, we have vital statistics databases, there are cancer registries, chronic disease reporting, and so on. And each collection method and parameters are unique. So once data is typically collected, it's then reviewed and what we call scrubbed to detect errors, duplication, and outliers. Once that's completed, the data can then be used to report trends, conduct comparisons, track rates over time, create graphs, and so forth. Rarely is this ever done in real time. So for example, when we do influenza reports, they're typically a weekly report, and they actually have at least a week delay. For our sexually transmitted diseases and infections, we do incidence and prevalence, and we often compare those annually, biannually, or monthly. So comparisons will typically occur for data weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually, but in real time or daily, almost never. So the COVID-19 pandemic has people wanting case numbers, trends, hospitalization rates, death rates, recovered rates, active cases in real time. Everyone wants this data today. In all honesty, the public health data collection system, their analysis and the reporting system, it's just not designed to do this. The system that we're actually using for COVID-19 in this pandemic is what we call a disease case investigation system. It contains loads of information, demographics, symptoms, laboratory reports, outbreaks, details connecting to other cases. It isn't a simple case count system. It's not just numbers in a data collection place. So it's interesting as we reflect through the pandemic, as public health practitioners, we heard the request that the community and the media wanted and needed daily real-time data. We've been doing our best to provide that data that was meaningful to describe the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic for our community. But by doing so, we've almost set ourselves up for criticism and that our numbers are wrong or made up or useless because they might contain errors. But I want everyone to really think about this because it should be expected that real-time data from time to time can have errors or it may not match the local or state reporting processes. And that's because we refer to this data as raw data. So you as the public and media are receiving what we call raw data. And raw data has value, but it takes time to turn raw data into meaningful data. And that time is something that unfortunately we don't have during a pandemic. So this leads me to the issue at hand. Why does Erie County Daily Counts and PA Department of Health Daily Counts not match every day? ECDH, the Erie County Department of Health, is using a different reporting time frame. It's still a 24-hour time frame, similar to the Pennsylvania Department of Health, but it isn't the same time frame. So we at the Erie County Department of Health, we report 3 p.m. to 3 p.m., so a 24-hour period, and then we report that at 9 o'clock a.m. the next day. Pennsylvania Department of Health downloads their data every evening at midnight, and they report out at noon. This would probably lead you to ask, why is the Erie County Department of Health using a different report cycle? Truthfully, it has to do with the workload and workflow of case investigation and reporting. This provides us more time throughout the workday to collect and review and report the data. I see that it's confusing and I apologize for that. And I want you to know that as an accredited health department, as any accredited health department will do, we would review this process, we will make adjustments as necessary and we'll continue to improve. So please keep in mind as we do this review, it will take time and it will take staff time. But I want you to know and trust that your Erie County Department of Health is reporting data that is accurate and reliable based on our workflow and our work day. Thank you for letting me speak today. Back to you. Thank you, Melissa. And now I'd like to turn it over to Shar Beringer to give us a uh, bit of an update on the health services side at the uh, Department of Health. Shar? can't hear you, Char. Could you repeat the, the question again, Kathy? It was a little bit garbled. I'm going to have you speak um, to give us a, a bit of an update on the clinical side from the Department of Health, unless you want to just be here to answer questions. 
I, one thing I would like to comment on is some uh, comments that were made by the World Health Organization recently that caused a little bit of confusion in, in the national media. Uh, there was initially a statement made that uh, asymptomatic cases uh, were perhaps rare. Uh, World Health Organization came out the next day and basically qualified that, uh, said they really don't have good data, good data, excuse me, on how often asymptomatic cases contribute to disease count. Uh, but I think what the public does need to understand is that there are pre-symptomatic, there is pre-symptomatic disease spread. So we know that with COVID disease, people can be infectious two days before their first symptom. So we call that pre-symptomatic spread when it happens that way. Uh, the asymptomatic spread where someone truly does not have any symptoms throughout the, but still come out with a positive test throughout the whole 10 days of isolation, never have any symptoms. There's really not good data yet on how much that is influencing our case count. Uh, other than that, I'm open to Q&A. All right, thank you, Shar, and we'll get to the questions. But before we do, I just wanted to clarify um, regarding the uh, the origin, uh, the racial, racial and ethnic origin uh, numbers that I gave regarding those Hispanic, uh, we have 12% of total positive cases uh, listed as Hispanic, um, and we have 81% not Hispanic and 7% unknown. So I wanted to clarify that, um, so thank you. And now I'd like to turn it to the media for questions, and today we're gonna start with Erie News Now. Yeah, hi there, Kathy. This is John Laddick joining you today. Thanks so much uh, for the weekly updates. Um, I don't know if this is a question you or Melissa want to answer. Um, obviously, she clarified about the data discrepancy. At this point, um, which would you rather the public media be following the county or the state data? Which, which do you think is, is the best to follow at this point and why so? I'm going to have uh, Director Lyon address that. Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, I would say it's a personal preference, to be honest. Um, the, the, the numbers at the end of this pandemic are going to add up to the same. I can guarantee you that after all of the scrubbing and the analysis and determining which cases may or may not fit that. Um, I think from time to time, the state is doing a very um, robust review of data and uh, it's, it's trustworthy. If you want to know what we're doing day to day and how we're handling caseload day to day, then follow what we're doing uh, in reporting. Because ours really would say, if you see numbers that said there were 28 cases on a specific day, you can be sure that we were working on those 28 cases in a 24 hour period. Um, if you see 10 cases, then you'll know we are working on those 10 cases in a 24 hour period. So it would depend, do you want a local flair or do you want the, the, the state um, compiled? And Melissa, I'll follow up to that. Um, what is the process then if the, the numbers are off that you and the State Department uh, go back and forth with to clarify those numbers and kind of get on the same page if you could expound upon that process? Yeah, it's not, um, it's not something that's done on a daily basis. Uh, ideally what happens is uh, there's information that comes into the, the, the disease surveillance system, which I had said to you is a case investigation system. It's not so much of a data collection. It collects data, but it's, it's not functioning the way that um, you all would like it to function maybe in, in the public where we're just counting cases. So information gets added into there. And then information is also added in by case investigators. And so um, throughout the adding of additional information is where that clarification begins to happen. So uh, we would be the ones that determine probable cases, for example. A probable case doesn't normally have a laboratory confirmed with it. So the case investigators adding that case in there. Um, so it, it's not done right, like day to day at nine o'clock every day. It's an ongoing process that we do. Shar, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, I think you described it very well. It really just comes down to we're reporting within different time frames. Uh, so the numbers are going to vary between the state and our local numbers. But I think if we paused at a certain date and neither one of us reported, you would see that those two numbers would then eventually match up, if that makes sense. 
Um, we, we, we always catch up. We're one ahead, a couple behind. It's just based on our reporting process. And we're going to revisit that, just so everyone's aware. Thank you, Jet Thank TV. you much. Uh, Jet TV. Yeah, hi, Kathy. It's Samir. Uh, so really fast, uh, Governor Wolf last week uh, on Friday mentioned that he believed Erie County was facing an outbreak, possibly uh, high numbers of community spread. So I guess, would you classify us as facing an outbreak? We are definitely seeing community spread. Um, it's something we've talked about many times in these press briefings. Um, we saw some community spread before, but nothing as widespread as we're seeing it. But I would really prefer if um, uh, maybe uh, Shar Beringer would talk about um, community spread and outbreak, or Director Lyon, one or the other, could speak to that, please. Uh, I can certainly address that. Uh, way back when the pandemic started, a, a definition of community spread was put out by the State Health Department that basically when we reached uh, six cases where we didn't know where the, the person, when we interviewed them, didn't have any idea where they possibly contracted the disease, that is called community spread. So we've been at community spread for quite a while in our community. Uh, when we look at our trends in numbers, uh, whether it's the daily numbers, whether it's the seven-day numbers, whether it's the 14-day numbers, uh, we're continuing to go up right now in these last couple weeks. Uh, an outbreak talks about numbers of cases, and our numbers of cases are going up. I think it would be fair to say that we have an outbreak, yes. Um, Erie Times News. Hi, Kathy. It's David. This this one's probably for either Melissa or Char. Um, I think, Kathy, you had just said 34% of the cases involve um, African Americans. I believe that is a pretty significant increase from earlier on in the pandemic. Um, if it, we can, what are some of the reasons for this, and what are some of the, the ways that the county health department is going to try to address this? Melissa or Shar? Shar, I'm happy to take um, what we're doing right now in our community outreach. So uh, we do know that our most vulnerable populations uh, across the country tend to be um, black uh, or uh, of new American um, health literacy issues, uh, income, housing, all of the social determinants of health, as we've been talking about for those of you that follow public health for a very long time, we know puts populations at a higher risk of poor health outcomes um, and increased uh, death rates. So we acknowledged that very early on and worked within uh, the community centers and what they wanted to be doing for an enhanced outreach and screening. And we've done some additional testing in those communities as well. Now, the great news through that testing was we did not find a large number of disease uh, lurking in those communities, which was, was really a great outcome. Um, to talk about why it may have had a large jump, I've not been on those clinical calls lately, so I don't have that information at my fingertips. So I'll default to Char if she has something additional to add. Well, in general, when we talk about disease spread, we know that some behaviors that we can use do help control community spread. Those behaviors are wearing the mask, particularly when we're within six feet of anyone, and maintaining that physical distancing of six feet. It's hard to do that, especially as the weather is getting nicer. We want to be outside. We want to get that sunshine. But that is the major way that we can control the exposures that we have to disease and the spread of the disease in our community. When you look at so is the housing percent, also. The percentage jump among African Americans, is, is it, are you saying that it's because people are outside more? I mean, and, and does any role um, in terms of the, the protests recently, does that play any role in the increase we've seen in the percentage of cases being among um, black residents of the county? Uh, we do not know that specifically. We know that any time that there is a crowded situation where people are close, where people are not wearing masks, there is certainly the risk of increased disease transmission. We did not know specifically if any of our recent cases are uh, related to that. 
Again, incubation period is two to 14 days. Thanks, Char. Thank you, David. Um, Erie, or talk, Erie. Joel, are you with us? Yes, hi, Kathy. It's Joel in the tally. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Hey, uh, a question for our guests. Um, from March 18th until deep into May, the county pr uh, reported their own PCR confirmed case count, but then we stopped and started adopting the state case count for a while because of the workload burden. Does the county Department of Health know specifically how many PCR virus positives, how many probables, and how many positive antibody tests that there have been? Char? Okay, the numbers that we report out are a combination of both the PCRs and the probables. Because from a disease investigation viewpoint, they are handled in the same way. Uh, the antibody tests at this point, no, they are not being counted. Uh, they are not relevant to our current mitigation efforts. So just as a follow-up, Char, uh, uh, Secretary Levine and the CDC are reporting antibody test totals. Uh, so would that mean that we should not look at the state numbers if we want to know what kind of current um, viruses that we have in our community? Uh, the antibody numbers do not tell you about current virus in the community. Right. The antibody tests tell you about past disease in the community. It's the PCRs and the probable numbers, which is our total number that we that is let out on a daily basis. That is current disease in our community. So, so again, with the state adding antibodies, that would make them a little bit less trustworthy as far as what current uh, rate of virus is right now, correct? Uh, the state is not putting antibodies in their total numbers. They may be reporting them separately, but they are not including them in their total numbers. That is my that okay, is our understanding the from the state. Thank you. Erie News Now. John. Yeah, hi there, Kathy. Um, a question for you. I know you addressed the county's perspective on businesses opening um, despite being in the yellow phase. Do you have do you and the county have any plans for enforcement on some of those business businesses? And if not, um, what would it take for potential enforcement in terms of crowd numbers and businesses? So we are, again, we do not endorse any business opening um, and uh, defying the mandates, the orders uh, of the governor and the state. And we will be um, doing, as we've always done, trying to educate our businesses about the yellow phase and, and what is allowed and what's not allowed. And so uh, if we know of a business that has been open, we will be in contact with them. Uh, through uh, a letter and email uh, stating such that they are in violation and um, also, uh, you know, with the understanding that this is difficult for them, but they should definitely get legal counsel um, before they make that move to make sure that they are not putting their business in the long term in jeopardy. Is follow up on that, is there a specific threshold? I mean, just, just if they're open or, you know, if there's a certain amount of people. If you're open and your business is not allowed to be open in the yellow phase, then we will be sending that notice to you. Um, and if there's anything within the jurisdiction of county government, of course, we will, we will continue to enforce county government jurisdiction as we always have. Uh, so, but if it's um, a violation of state mandate, we will be reporting that to, uh, to the business, and we'll also actually be keeping uh, records of that and, rep and reports of that also will be going out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Jet TV, Samir. Yeah, hi, Kathy, Samir. Uh, so really quick, so then on Friday, just to follow up, I guess, regarding uh, the businesses, why, I guess, did you not make that a little bit more clear that the county would enforce? I mean, by no means did you say, yes, go ahead and open up these businesses, but you just said uh, with limited resources, you guys would be focusing on other things. So I guess why now uh, what seems to be a change of heart? It's not a change in heart. It's not a change in philosophy. Um, and maybe I wasn't clear enough on Friday, but um, I never, ever said that businesses should not follow the state orders. And... Um, you know, they, they do put themselves at risk. And we've been saying this all along. When we went from red to yellow, um, we said this to businesses also. And uh, they put themselves under great risk of losing potentially their license, uh, fines, 
uh, their insurance. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of inherent risk to doing this, and we want businesses to be aware of that. Um, what I did say is we have to get back to the business of county government, and all of our enforcement team that we've been using these past three months is mostly our environmental team, the people who go out and uh, inspect our restaurants, our, our tattoo shops, our campgrounds, our septic systems, and so many other things, and uh, pools, uh, beach water. So we have to get back to doing the business of uh, county government, uh, our typical business wheelhouse, for the safety of the community. And so those resources um, have to be realigned to go in. Uh, now that we have restaurants, for example, even with outdoor seating, we have to get in there and do restaurant inspections. And so we've got to get back to that business. And we don't have the resources to continue to do the very, very strong, comprehensive um, enforcement that we were doing, particularly under the red uh, phase and even moving into the yellow. And um, again, as more things open, you know, with last week's our beaches opening and restaurants having outdoor seating, we just see our resources being pulled in too many ways. And we've got to get back to the core of what we are mandated to do. Thank you. And then uh, have you spoken to the governor's administration following yesterday's announcement that Erie County would not uh, be part of the next batch to go into the green phase? The governor made an announcement that we're not part of that yesterday? Well, no, I said, have you spoken to his administration since Friday? Oh, Friday. I thought you since yesterday. Um, I have talked to a representative of the administration um, continuing to push, obviously, that I believe we're ready to go to green in this community. And I will continue to do that. Erie Times News. Thanks. David, are you with us? Hi, Kathy. I, I can barely hear you. Um, okay, maybe we could get is, um, the person here at uh, WQLN to try to. The volume does seem a little low today. I don't know if there's any way that we can up the volume here. But anyway, okay. is that any better? Sure. Yep, I, I can hear you a little bit better now. Okay. Uh, my question is, the state is, has been publishing uh, specific data on, on nursing homes, long-term care facilities, and the numbers have been strange, to say the least. Um, currently, they're listing five deaths at Erie County long-term care facilities, 19 cases among residents, 15 among staff. Is that accurate? I know there have been many mistakes with this particular piece of data from the state. Is there anything that Melissa or Char might know about the accuracy of this? Is this data we can use? Has there been five deaths at long-term care facilities in the county? Uh, Melissa or Char? Uh, when we report deaths, it's basically from information that we receive from facilities. Uh, I am not positive that the five is accurate, but it is certainly close if it's not totally accurate. Uh, we know that uh, <laughs> In the past week or two, there have been some discrepancies with specific facilities, uh, and those have basically been data entry errors on the state's part. We send data to the state, they put it into their database. We don't enter directly into their database, long-term care facilities, and uh, I'm sure that you've seen it, it's very small print, even when enlarged, uh, and some lines mm -hmm. got transposed, and I, to the best of my knowledge, that has been straightened out now. For a particular facility and do, do we have any idea what the county's hospitalization rate is for COVID um, I know the national hospitalization rate is, is 82 per 100,000 do we have any idea if we're close to that or, or what our hospitalization rate is in Erie County okay hospitals rate is reported by the hospitals that is not reported by the Erie County Department of Health Okay, so that's not something that the county has. They're not They don't have a track on that at all. That is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. I have seen that information on the state website, and so the hospitals are reporting, I believe, to the state. And I would recommend that anyone who's interested in those um, go on the PA Department of Health website um, to gather that information. Talk Erie, Joel. Yes, hi, Kathy. This one's for you. On Friday, you had said that you were waiting for metrics Thursday night from the state. You know, what is the goalpost, if you will? Do you have those metrics now, what they're looking for, for Erie to be eligible for green? 
Not specifically. There's nothing been um, specifically relayed to me that this is where we need to be for green. Um, but as I've said before, the metrics have changed over time, which I find very frustrating. Um, and I know we're in a pandemic and things have been continued to evolve and I'm trying to be um, as understanding and patient as I can, but this is our community's future and our, not even our future, our current situation. And so it is frustrating and I, I would certainly um, welcome more uh, communication to my office from the state on this. Now, I don't know if uh, Director Lyon has anything further, if she's gotten anything further on the metrics uh, that the state's using, but I'll, I'll just turn it over to her to, to respond to that. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that the state needs to see our community either level off in the number of cases over a time frame or time period, and, and in particular, a two-week uh, rolling total, or begin to decline. Um, and there are, I've asked for additional communication with the uh, epidemiology uh, team and the Secretary of Health as they're looking at that information. Uh, will they share it routinely and regularly with me? Um, and recently, I did just get an update late last night that on the 14-day case count um, over the two-week period, on June 9th, um, we were now at 144. That's up 90 additional cases. So that's the moving window. That's a two-week period, so we're up 90. Um, we're watching the numbers to see where the trends are going and in communication. But the goalpost, to my knowledge, is keeping case counts level and then in the, in the declining direction. And I'm not, I can't predict when that will happen for us as a community. Just a quick follow-up, Melissa. One of my colleagues is reporting that we needed to have less than 10 cases uh, over 14 days in order to go green. Has that been a metric that you've heard of? No, I'm not aware of that metric at, uh, at all. The, the, the 10 cases per 100,000 over a 14-day period, if anything, it would tie back to the data that they were looking at in order to go yellow, but even that's not incredibly accurate on how, you, uh, how it's been relayed to you. So the answer, short answer is no, I'm not familiar with that metric. Thank you. Erie News Now, do you have any last question? Yeah, two quick ones for you, Kathy. Um, I know uh, Representative Bizarro um, had talked last week uh, about he is encouraging uh, businesses within the county to go green or within his district at least. Um, have you had any follow-up discussions with him about those comments um, in terms of informing businesses to operate under that sense? Not, not about that specific comment. Okay, and then the other follow-up, um, I believe it was Monday they released the county dashboard, uh, I believe with the state health department in terms of, uh, you know, what metrics or, or, and or what, what things they're looking at. Um, what are your thoughts on that website and does that cause you any concern at, when you look at, at what that's reporting and how close or far away for that matter Erie may be? Well, again, my frustration continues to be that the metrics seem to keep changing. And um, at one point, they were using the Carnegie Mellon University data dashboard, and, and it just seems to keep changing, and it's just frustrating um, for our community. And I think, I believe, this is my opinion, that the state needs to look at more than just the disease rate. I know we're in a global pandemic, but we're also in an economic crisis. We know we are definitely in a recession now that has been already um, shown to be proven. Um, we know that there is much uh, anguish and fear and anxiety and uh, all of that from people out there who, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, they're, they're concerned about the virus, they're concerned about their job, they're concerned about paying the bills, they're, they're concerned about so many things. And, and I think we really need to look at all of the factors and find safe way to open up our community so that people can get back to work. And again, I'm going to say this over and over again, our businesses that are open are really doing a great job in trying to protect us. I truly believe if the governor would put us to green, that those other businesses, when they open up, will also do their due diligence to protect us and to protect their employees. 
And so we have to trust our businesses and know that our economy, if it doesn't get going, we're going to have more deaths and more illness and more problems from the economic fallout from this than we've already had. Uh, Thanks for your time today, Kathy. Sure. Jet TV, Samir, do you have any other question? Yes, just uh, one more. Taking into consideration, we now have uh, Presque Isle uh, beaches open as well as outdoor seating at area restaurants. Do you think we're kind of going further down the rabbit hole, of course, uh, an increased chance of uh, COVID-19 numbers? So do you think this is kind of hurting our chance of going to green, being in it uh, as long as we are or keep or if we stay in it? Well, I find it very frustrating that when the state says we cannot go to green, on the same day, they also open up our beaches and allow all sorts of tourists to come here. Now, we always want them to come here for our economy, but they are bringing COVID-19 into this community. I can pretty much guarantee you that. And our people are also going out to these other communities surrounding us to get their hair cut, to go eat inside of a restaurant, to do other things they can't do here. And that COVID-19 is just always looking for a new host. So as people move around more, and I've been talking for three months, try to stay as close to home as you can, uh, that just gives more and more opportunity for COVID-19 to move around. So it is frustrating, and it is frustrating when I go out and I see so many people without masks on and without keeping their six foot distance. I don't know how else to make this case to the public about how important that piece is. Um, and uh, I can't say it enough, but it doesn't seem to be really making a difference. Um, the more I say it, it just seems like almost these days the worse it gets. So again, not in the businesses. When you go inside of a business, it's, it's still very, very good. Um, but it's when people are out and with their friends and at picnics and, and doing other social activities. So um, these are all added factors and we need to find a way to live with COVID-19 for the next year at least. And so let's work together to do that. Um, but we need our businesses open, in my opinion, to be able to do that. Erie Times, Erie Times News, do you have any final question, David? Sure, Kathy. And this is for either you or, or Melissa or Shar. Um, youth sports teams in Erie County, are they permitted to travel to either green counties or counties outside the state? that allow competitions and practices? What, what, what's the, what are the guidelines for these youth sports teams? Um, Director Lyon, do you know the exact answer to this? Because I don't have that recreation guideline in front of me, and I don't know it as well as some others do. I do not have that in front of me either, Kathy. There are guidelines, and our environmental team is much more um, in the weeds on this and knows all of the criteria. Uh, they've read it and studied it, and, and it is also on the state website. Um, but again, if, if we're in the yellow phase and people are going to other, phase, other counties just around us and traveling, the traveling is a problem. You know, We've talked about having a staycation this summer, that that's really the best for all of us, to stay close to home, uh, to not be traveling great distances. And the more you travel and the more you're with other people, and we know that sports, it's hard to wear a mask. And, and be breathing heavy on, in a sport activity. Uh, so mask wearing becomes much more of a concern, in my opinion. Um, and when you breathe heavy in a sport activity, that just causes, if you have the virus, those droplets to go further. So a six foot distance is no longer adequate, but yet the game is being played. And obviously you can't always be six foot or more away from people, depending on the sport. So those are all the inherent risks and concerns around sport activities for all. And then a follow-up, a different question. Um, I know we're up statewide to 20 confirmed cases of, of Miss C, the, um, the inflammatory disease that, that children are getting that's related to COVID. Have we heard, have we had any confirmation of any of those cases originating with um, Erie County children? I'll turn that over to Shar. Uh, we do not at this time. Thank you. Okay. And talk Erie, you, uh, talk Erie, Joel, do you have any? Uh, last question. Just, well, just one more for Shar. Uh, Shar, it's been a couple weeks since the the riots downtown. Ha, do you, have you seen any active cases that are connected to protests or other large gatherings? Churches starting to reopen and so on. Uh, we do not know specifically if any of our uh, newer cases are related to those activities. 
Thank you. Again, we, we can only uh, we can only go on what people tell us as far as what their exposures have been. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Director Miss Melissa Lyon and, and uh, Char Charlotte Berenger for coming on with me. Of course, two people who I greatly respect who do great work and have continued to do great work over many months for us here in Erie County as we all deal with the pandemic. And before I close, I want to say it's your weekly reminder to please complete the 2020 Census. Again, I cannot express uh, how strongly enough how important this is to our community's future and the funding that we will get for any further pandemic or the multitude of other services that we get funding for from the federal government. So the response numbers for this week are 69% of households throughout Erie County and the city, of course, which is part of the county, but specifically within the city, 60% of the households have responded. So we still have almost 30% in the county and 40 percent within the city that we need to respond we'd love to have every single person counted in the 2020 census you can complete the 2020 census by going to my that's my 2020 census.gov or by mail you would have received some mail about this or you can call 844-330-2020 and they're also training uh, uh jobs still available they're currently training and being organized, the census employees, and you can apply online at 2020census.gov backslash jobs. So if you need a job or if you just want to help our community get counted, then please think about helping out with the census this year. And finally, just uh, as a final note, um, I'm glad to be with you here today and I will be back next week. But in the meantime, I do ask you to try to stay as close to home as you can. Always, always wear your mask when you're out and with other people and keep your six foot distance. And during all this time, please do what you can to stay safe and to keep your family members safe. Please remember to stay calm throughout this pandemic. Thank you.